Oh my goodness. Uh, hasn't Kenny and the band done a great job uh, this week? I, I appreciate them. And I appreciate uh, your singing. We look forward to uh, the concert on Thursday. That's going to be a, a really great time together. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn tonight to Romans chapter 6. And as you're turning there, um, you know, when I was a, a young boy, I was, I was fascinated with a particular escape artist called Harry Houdini. Uh, he was a great uh, escape artist. Uh, he was a master of locks. Uh, and, and I loved reading about this guy and, and the various uh, tricks or escapes that he would do. And, and I was doing some research at one point in time on his life and discovered that Harry Houdini had made a... Uh, basically had put out a, a charge that there was no jail cell that he could be uh, put into that he could not escape from in 15 minutes. And he had put out this grand uh, statement and there was an official in a very small area that had heard about it and invited Harry Houdini. He said, I have a jail, I have a cell that you'll not be able to get out of. And, and Harry Houdini in his arrogance and in his pride, he, he took this uh, challenge and he showed up and, and this was a small, small area. They, they didn't have a lot going on. This was not a, a time when we had Facebook and we had internet and we had other things. So I mean, everyone is gathered outside and, and they, the, the, the atmosphere is just electric as they wait. And the official took Harry Houdini, walked him into the cell and as the door closed, he walked out. And of course, the crowd's just cheering for uh, for this and taunting Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini reached down and rolled over his belt. He carried a small wire underneath his belt and he began to go to work on the lock. And he worked and 15 minutes passed and he had not been able to get free. And at the 15 minute mark, the crowd just explodes outside. Harry Houdini, still in his arrogance, he refuses to give up. He keeps working on the lock, keeps working on the lock. Half an hour goes by, 45 minutes goes by. And, and, and by the time an hour had passed, he was sweating profusely. There was a puddle of sweat on the floor. And in absolute exhaustion, he collapsed to the floor with his back against the door. And as soon as he did, the door swung open. It had never been locked to begin with. And friends, can I just say to you that that's exactly what Satan tries to do to those who call Jesus by name. He tries to convince us that we're in a cell that's locked when in reality we're free. We're free. We are free in Christ Jesus. But when we talk about being free in Christ, it doesn't mean that we're free to live or to do whatever we want to do. In fact, living and doing whatever we want to do is the very definition of sin. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. So this freedom in Christ is not free to live however we want to, but it's actually a freedom to be able to live the way God calls us to live. You know, there have been, and I suspect there always will be, ungodly people who turn the grace of God into a license for evil. There have been, and there probably always will be, individuals who will turn the grace of God into a license to do evil. But as new creatures in Christ, as those who call upon the Lord and have trusted in Him, as we learned last night, we've been transformed. The old life is gone and we have been freed to obey Christ. And the very grace that saves us is the grace that empowers us to say no to sin. It's an enabling power through the Holy Spirit. We are free to actually live the change in our life. And that's good news. Because sin choices bring ruin and destruction and consequences in life. It's not good for us. It's not good for our families. It's not good for others. And so to know that Christ has set us free and in that freedom actually empowers us to walk in obedience. Folks, that's good news. Amen? That's good news. And tonight, I want us to see how this transformational work of grace through faith in Jesus Christ 
does three things. It, it frees us from the power of sin. It frees us from the presence of sin. And it frees us from the penalty of sin. Let's look together in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We'll be working through uh, this entire chapter. But in Romans chapter 6, let's begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we, have been, if, for if we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Will you pray with me? Father, Lord, I pray that tonight, for those of us who already know you as Savior and Lord, that God, tonight, you would help us to see the truth and not believe the lies any longer that we are in bondage or in mastery under sin. That we are free if we know Jesus Christ. And not free to just live however we want to live, but free to actually walk in newness of life, in obedience to Christ. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that is, that is searching and trying to understand how to be free from the, the bondage of sin and the chains of sin and the shame and the guilt, and they're searching, that God, you may open their heart, open their eyes and open their ears tonight, that they may see the freedom that is promised in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it was Jesus himself who made the statement that I believe Paul is at this point in this chapter expounding upon. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 8 verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, do you remember uh, night before last when I had Brandon up here and I had him in chains and I had him blindfolded and I had him weighed down with the, with the weight of the, of the bricks in his hand? And we saw this picture of bondage. We saw this picture of where sin enslaves us. And Jesus says, truly, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And then he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. In other words, if we come to know Jesus Christ by his grace, we are adopted as his sons and daughters. And then Jesus said, so if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. See, the message of Jesus Christ is a message about freedom. And we see as Paul begins to take this into account in this chapter, the first thing he helps us understand is that we are free from the power or the authority of sin over our lives. He says in verse 6 of chapter 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. In verse 14 he says, For sin shall not be master over you. It's not going to be able to rule you. It's not going to be able to control you. You are free 
in Christ Jesus. And so Paul asks the question as he starts this chapter, having talked about in, in Romans chapter 3 that we've all sinned, having talked about in Romans 5 that we are helpless, ungodly sinners, children of wrath, but that God demonstrated his love for us. He is building up into this chapter and then he asks the question, so if you trust in Christ and you are freed from sin, here's the question, are we to continue, in other words, to persist in Sin, so that grace can abound. And in the Greek language, it's written in such a way that it's, a, it's an exclamation in his answer. And he says, may it never be. Absolutely not. What he's saying is that, that this cannot be the heart of one who, and the mind of one who truly follows Christ. That we have the attitude, well, I'll just sin because after all, Grace is there and God will forgive me. Paul says this can't be the attitude of one who truly knows Christ. It's interesting because Paul is not the only one that addresses this particular issue in the New Testament. There's another man by the name of Jude. He wrote a little book that you'll find right before the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. It's one chapter. And Jude actually opens the chapter saying, I wanted to write to you about certain things. And he says, but I can't. And he says, I can't because there are those among you, listen to what he says, there are certain persons, ungodly persons, who turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Try saying that several times fast. That just means a license for evil, for debauchery, for uh, immoral, 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 immorality. And they deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want to write to you about something, but I can't because there are individuals that are using grace as a license to do evil. Now, we all know if you've had teenagers, or if you remember back to your teenage years, that when you get a license, that's a big deal. <laughs> you get to have the freedom to drive the car but there are responsibilities with that freedom. And while grace sets us free, there are also responsibilities that we have as followers of Christ. And one of those, Paul says, is we absolutely cannot turn the grace of God into a license, permission to sin and to do evil. The grace of God in the first century was being abused. There were actually individuals who as they heard about grace and they heard about the God of mercy and they heard about the God of forgiveness, they just said, well, if that's God, then I'll just live like I want to live and sin all the more because grace will abound all the more. And Paul says, no, how can you even claim to know Christ if that's the attitude of your heart? See, the attitude was I can sin because grace will forgive me. Paul says, may it never be. And then he explains why. Look what he says. He says, we died to sin. Now, I want to I point out something. He's not saying sin is dead. Sin is very much alive. All we got to do is look around us to know that sin and temptation is very much alive. But we are dead to sin. And if you're dead to something, you're to be unresponsive to it. Its power over us as Christians is gone. And then Paul illustrates this by reminding them of what baptism was a picture of. And baptism represented that passing from death to life. Now, Cody, I want to ask you something. I didn't ask you ahead of time, but would you come help me with something? Cole, I'm sorry. Come here, Cole. Uh, I need someone who's smaller than I am. Come here. <laughs> Now, we're going to have Cole kind of help us think about baptism. Now, baptism on dry land is a little more difficult than baptism in the water because I have to carry all your weight, so hang in there. Um, <laughs> remember Boney DeBroni the other night? Yeah, so hang in there. Um, baptism, when you stand in the waters of baptism, that picture is the picture of Christ's death. Now, when you're lowered into the water, you can go ahead and step back on my leg. There you go. When you're lowered into the water, your abs will fill this tomorrow. It'll be great. When you're in the water, it's a picture of the burial. And when you come out of the water, it's a picture of what? 
the resurrection. And Paul says, listen to me, you've got this attitude that says I can sin because grace is, will abound. And he says, no, you died to sin. Do you not even remember what your baptism was the public proclamation of? You died, you were buried with Christ, and you were raised to life. But your life lived as though I can just do whatever I want to do because after all, God will forgive me. He says that is to live in a manner contradictory to the very testimony you gave in your baptism. In that public witness of the death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you. That's... See, baptism is first of all that picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. But listen, it's also a picture of something else. It's a picture of something else because we know that Jesus Christ was sinless and yet Jesus was baptized. His baptism was a picture of what he was ultimately going to do for sinners to die, be buried, and risen again. But his baptism also was the beginning of his public ministry. It was that moment that his life was publicly set aside for the purpose that he had come for as Messiah. And see, when you and I are baptized, it is also a pledge. It is also that setting aside of our life to say, there was a life back then, but this is life now. And I pledge my life as I put my faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of sin to live my life for Christ Jesus. It was a picture of being purified and set apart to God. And it was accomplished by Christ's death and resurrection. Paul says, if we became united with him, and if that happened at his crucifixion, when by faith we put our faith and trust in Christ, and we believe that we died to sin, our lives were with Christ at his cross, he tells us then what the purpose of that was. So that we might walk in, what does it say? Newness of life. See, God tells us again that we are remade and repurposed. So that we might walk in newness of life. That's God's purpose for everyone who puts their faith and trust in Christ. You will have my grace and my spirit enabling you to actually walk in life. Do you realize, listen to me friends, that to walk in sin is to walk in death. It's to walk in the ruin and to walk in the destruction that's caused by that. And so he says in verse 4, As Christ was raised from the dead through the glory, the power of the Father, so we too, by that same power, walk in newness of life. Now please don't misunderstand me tonight. We don't walk in newness of life by our own strength or our own ability. It is impossible. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. It is by grace and by His enabling power that we can have new life. But that new life is accomplished by Christ. But the walking is something that he, he says, you have a responsibility in it. You have a part to play. There's something you're responsible to do. That word walk means to behave or conduct ourselves. To live in a particular uh, lifestyle or a quality of life. Paul said it in many of his writings. He said in 2 Corinthians 5.15, he said, And Christ died for all, so that they who live in Christ might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on his behalf. In Ephesians 1.4, it says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us for that purpose to be holy and blameless. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I implore you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. He said to the church at Philippi, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so there is a way in which we are to live as we walk. Now, how is that possible? He tells us, precisely how it's possible. Look at verse 5. Sin, 
Sin is made powerless. We have died with Christ. We believe that we shall live with him. Sin was made powerless through what Christ did. Sin was rendered ineffective. Verse 5, we were united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, there's no question about it. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now think about that. That old self crucified with Christ. So that sin in every aspect of its uh, uh, Every aspect over us is made powerless, it's rendered ineffective, it's rendered inoperative. But listen to what Satan does. Satan likes to pick up those chains and he likes to rattle them around our lives and he likes to try to deceive us and convince us that we can't resist temptation. He tries to convince us that we're still in shackles. He tries to convince us as followers of Christ that we're still in bondage. And Paul says, no, no, sin was made powerless. You're free. See, God made the provision for us to be able to walk a holy life, a life that's pleasing and acceptable to Him. And he provided us with the potential for resisting sin. So he says, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are free. Free indeed. Now think about what, that's, what that really means. If we're no longer slaves to sin, it means we're no longer slaves to pride. We're no longer slaves to materialism. We're no longer slaves to jealousy. We're no longer slaves to coveting. We're no longer slaves to impatience. We're no longer slaves to lust and pornography. We're no longer slaves to disrespect of authority. We're no longer slaves to lying and stealing and bitterness and resentment. We're no longer slaves to unforgiveness or sexual immorality. The people of God are free. We're no longer in bondage. If we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with Christ. Now, Paul at this point says, Christ is our example. Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. If you're a follower of Christ, do you believe that? He says that death no longer is master over Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, do you believe that? He says he died to sin once for all and Jesus lives to God. If you're in Christ Jesus, do you believe that? Then Paul says, therefore, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall live with Christ. If, if sin is no longer master over him, and if death is no longer master over him, and if he can live unto God by the power of grace and his enabling work in us, so we too shall live in a manner worthy of the gospel. We're free. Now, look where Paul takes this. So he says we're free from the power and authority of sin, and what that ultimately means is that we are free from the presence of sin in our lives. Look at verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as a slave for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. 
I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification, resulting in living holy is what sanctification means. So look what Paul is saying. Paul is, Paul is not presenting the fact that it is impossible for a Christian to sin. That's not what Paul is saying. But what he is saying is the impossibility of continuing in a life dominated by sin. That's what Paul is teaching. I like to say it this way. We are not sinless, but we should be sinning less every day of our lives as we walk with Jesus. Let me just say that again in case you missed that. One who follows Jesus Christ is not sinless, but he should be sinning less every day that he walks with Christ. Will we always be engaged in the battle against temptation and sin? Yes. But we're not in bondage. We can actually walk in obedience because we're free. That's the difference. Someone without Christ is still in bondage to sin. We will always and must always continue to struggle with sin. To repent and to seek forgiveness for sins committed. But the direction of our life is obedience to Christ and death to sin. Now let me try to illustrate it this way. If I took and I invested some money and made a financial investment. And I came back at the end of the quarter and I continued to review those investments over several years, what I would like to see is that that money has grown. The investment has been fruitful, amen? Wouldn't that be great, right? And this is what it might look like. If you look at that financial investment, there are going to be some valleys, some times when it drops, but the overall growth of that investment is positive growth. That is a great picture of what Paul is trying to illustrate to us. If we know Christ, the attitude of our heart cannot be, oh, I'll just sin because God will forgive me. After all, he's a loving God, right? He says, no, that can't be our heart. We're free. We have God's grace and God's power to resist temptation and to walk in obedience. And so the trajectory of our life, the direction should be one of growth. Yes, there will be moments of valleys, moments where we stumble. But I want to ask you something tonight. Those of you who know Jesus, who've walked with him for a while, what would the graph of your life look like? Not if you drew it. Not if your sugar booger drew it. If God who is holy looked at your life and he put it on paper to say, have you matured? Have you grown up in your faith? What would it look like? And what I want to say to you tonight, tonight is if our graph and, and our life does not look one that has that direction of growth, if that's not happening in our life, then we have an attitude in our heart if we truly know Christ that is contradictory to the very purpose of your salvation in Christ. And the church must deal with that. Because when we live with such a wrong attitude about grace, do you realize what it teaches the world around us? Do you realize the disrespect, the dishonor that it communicates to those around us about the one who saved us when our attitude is, well, I can sin because after all, God will forgive me. And Paul is beside himself. He says, no, no, no. This can never, ever be the heart of a true follower of Christ. May it never be. So 
What does he tell us to do? How can we actually walk in this freedom so that we're freed from the presence of sin more and more in our life every day? Paul, first of all, says, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Consider, that word consider is that, that word to affirm, to uh, uh, acknowledge, to reckon, to accept. He's saying you need to have on a daily basis, you need to be mentally and spiritually reflecting upon and thinking about the fact of that truth that you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. Now this is not some kind of pretending. It's the reality of who we are in Christ. In other words, Paul says, don't forget who you are. Because you're going to be in a world that Satan is going to try to lie to you every single day. He's going to rattle the chains around you and say, there's no way, there's no way that you can resist temptation. There's no way that you can say no to sin. There's no way that you can live as God has called you to live. And after all, just depend on grace. See, we've got to get to a place that we see grace not just as a safety net when we sin, but as the power of God to live life in freedom. Grace instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live righteously and godly in the present age. Titus chapter 2. That's what grace does. So consider yourselves... And, and notice that this is a command. It's in the imperative. And it's written in the Greek that it's to be a continuous thing. Indicating the necessity that we keep on affirming this reality day in and day out. That we are dead to sin and alive to God. Now, I'm going to try to illustrate this for you. And this is the part of the message where things, I mean, we're going to get some heavy teaching, okay? It's going to be heavy. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> Paul says, we are dead to what? Sin. That's who we are. We are dead to sin. This is, if you will, a foundational stone for those who know Christ as Savior and Lord. He says, consider yourselves, reckon, think about it often, every moment of every day, you are dead to sin. And he says, we are alive to God. We are alive. See, this is the other foundational aspect of our identity. So as we live life every day, we are to reckon and consider ourselves in the identity that Christ says we are. Notice there's no chains. Notice there's no blindness. Notice that we're not weighed down. We are dead to sin and alive to Christ. And Paul says, remember who you are. See, the problem is many of us don't fight and resist temptation standing on the right foundation. We tend to think that we're like Harry Houdini and we're locked in a cell when we're actually free. You're free. And if you're here in this room tonight and you've never trusted Jesus, this is why... When you meet a Christian who's really following after Christ, they get a little fired up about wanting you to know about God's grace and His love and His mercy because there's nothing quite like being free. We've got to remember, every day, Paul said it this way, So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, you've listened and attended to and obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. In other words, the spiritual father is saying, I've seen your life, I've watched you. You walk in obedience whether I'm with you or not. And that's awesome. But he says, work out. Cultivate, carry out to the goal. Fully complete, accomplish your salvation. Now, is he saying that we somehow work to earn salvation? No. He's saying live out who you are. Live it out. He says do it with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you. Not your strength. It's God in you. To will, to have the desire, and to work 
We get our word energy from this Greek word. To have the energy, to have the persistence to work for his good pleasure. Listen to what he says. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ when he comes back Paul says I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain look right here and listen to me when he says do everything without grumbling and complaining he's not talking about you know, walking around going, ah, it just stinks, it's going to cry me on, ah, it's raining again. I mean, yes, that's complaining. But what he's trying to get at is does your heart grumble and complain about walking in obedience to God? I've heard this passage taught out of context so many times where we use it as one of those passages where we, we're going to get the big message on not complaining. Can I just tell you, Paul says, what I'm talking about is you walk in obedience with God out of a joyful heart to walk in obedience to God because you're free. Don't complain and grumble about walking in obedience to God. Why would a free man grumble about his freedom? That's what he's saying. You're free. Live and rejoice in your freedom. Walk in obedience to God out of your freedom. You're free. And when you do that, this world that is so crooked and perverse around you is going to look at that and they will see the glory of Christ. Your life and the witness that I gave to you of Christ Jesus will not be in vain. It won't be useless. Other people are going to see that life can be different because of the grace and mercy of Christ. And so I just want to ask you, do you have a tendency in your life and in your heart to justify your sin, saying, well, God will forgive me. And then do you do worse than that? You grumble and complain when you know and you read that Scripture says, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. This is what Paul's getting to. In other words, Paul is speaking to the church going, I just want you to know there are some things that if you profess to know Christ, it doesn't make sense to live and act that way. And this is what he's trying to bring to light. We're told that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. I want you to think about this for a minute. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. In the context of that passage in John chapter 16, we're first told that the Holy Spirit's work is to convict the sinner of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So watch this. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us to truth. Jesus is the way, the truth. So the Holy Spirit brings conviction about sin, conviction about our inability to be righteous and the righteousness of Christ and conviction about the fact that there is a day of judgment coming and that's the work of the Holy Spirit to lead us to Christ. But then he goes on to say that the Holy Spirit continues to work to guide the believer into Christ's likeness. To lead us into truth. All of the truth of what it means to live and exist and to walk as a follower of Christ. That is a beautiful picture. That as we stand and remember and confirm this reality. That if I put my faith and trust in Jesus, I am dead to sin. I am alive to Christ. And I can trust that the Holy Spirit who led me to Christ is now at work in me to lead me to Christ's likeness. And I'm not going to grumble and complain about that. I'm not going to resist my heavenly daddy as he works on me so that I'm sinning less every day and looking more like Jesus. No, I'm not going to complain about that. I'm free. And I am free in order to live. That's an incredible promise. So Paul says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. There's always going to be a struggle, always going to be a battle. But listen to me. We need to get some theology stuff straight here. When you get up tomorrow, listen to me, you do not have to win. If you know Jesus, you do not have to win a victory over sin. 
It's already been won. <laughs> Listen, if we get this figured out, it's going to change everything in the church in the West. When you go through your day tomorrow, it's not about winning a victory against sin. The Bible says that that victory has been won. It was finished. Where, church? At the cross. And I was crucified with Christ. His death at the cross. When I put my faith and trust in Him, I was crucified. That old life dead, buried, and risen again. So listen, every day is not a battle for victory over sin. Every day is about whether or not the people of God will obey God or disobey God. See, if we can ever get that figured out, it kind of changes things, doesn't it? When we start to think about that temptation is not about victory over sin, because the victory's already been won, then we start to realize, oh, wait a minute. I'm either responsible to walk in the freedom I've been given and obey, or listen to this, or worse yet, as a follower of Jesus, I rebel in disobedience. Do you realize that when the people of God choose sin, disobedience over obedience, that it's actually to the heart of our Heavenly Father a harder thing for Him than when someone who is in bondage sins. Because those who know Jesus are free. And in our freedom, we choose disobedience. This is what Paul's trying to say. It cannot be the attitude of our heart. This is why when God spoke to Ezekiel, he said that when the people go after their idols, he says, it, he, he literally says, it. I am heartbroken. I am hurt deeply by the actions of my people who are called by my name who go after these other gods and idols and choose sin. God has made the provision for our holiness. Listen to what Jerry Bridges says. He, he gives a great statement about this. God has made provision for our holiness. Through Christ, He has delivered us from sin's reign so that we now can resist sin. Listen carefully. But the responsibility for resisting sin is ours. God does not do that for us. To confuse the potential for resisting sin, which God provided, with the responsibility for resisting sin, which is ours, is to court disaster in the pursuit of holiness. And friends, I would say to you that I really believe this is why the church is on the course that it's on right now. Where there is as much sin, as much immorality, as much pornography use, as much disrespect for authority, as much brokenness in family, disrespect of children to parents. All of these sins that are inundating the church because Satan has convinced the church, especially in the West, that freedom doesn't mean freedom. We're free. Paul says, so therefore, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. That word present means to offer. It literally means to surrender. And again, it's written in the continuous action. Don't continue to present your lives, the members of your body, to sin. In other words, in that old life, you came to Christ. And you were a sinner and sinning and sinning and sinning. And when you come to Christ, Paul's saying, don't continue in that sin. Because you're free. Don't present the members. Again, it's a command. Let me ask you something. Do you think it would be just and loving to command something of someone that is impossible for them to do? 
If, if someone, and in certain parts of the world there is still slavery going on, and because we have some children here, I'm not going to go into the details of what that slavery is. Adults, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's slavery going on. And if we looked at someone, a young girl that was in that kind of slavery, and we said to her, live like you're free. You're free. Go ahead, live like you're free. Do you see how cruel that would be? That's not what God is doing with us. The difference would be if this young lady is actually rescued and delivered from that slavery and brought into a new kingdom and then she's struggling to try to figure out how to live and you look at that sweet child and you say you're free now live in your freedom is that not the most loving thing that a redeemer deliverer and rescuer could say don't continue living like you're a slave. You're free. And God looks down over His people. And with every bit of His heart, He's saying, You're free. You're free. My grace, what I did at the cross, has set you free. You're in a different kingdom now. Live in your freedom. Not to do whatever you want to do. So the members of your body, your eyes, don't continue to look at what's impure. And friends, can we just acknowledge it's all around us. It's on the phone that we carry in our purse or our pocket. It inundates our culture through every form of media. Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, you name it. Our eyes can be drawn to immorality in a way that is unparalleled to any generation in history. Don't give your eyes over to look at what's impure. You're free. Your ears. Don't give your ears to listen to what's ungodly and immoral. You're free. Don't let your tongue, that member of your body, be used to speak lies and slander and gossip and tear down and be harsh and be, un, uh, be unkind. You're free. Stand in that freedom and resist the temptation to let the member of your body, your tongue, be used in that way. Don't let your hands take action in sin. Can I, I just, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. You go, wow, I didn't know you'd ever gotten off of it. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Listen to me. I, I want to say something. I'm very serious about this. It breaks my heart to see some of the things that Christians will do on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media. Where they will shout off like they think they got all the freedom to say anything they'd like to say. And I have watched professing Christians be as unkind and terrible in the comments that they make on their Facebook fa uh, feeds and responses to others. Can I just say to you, don't present the members of your body to sin in that way. You are free. You are free. And people ought to be able to look at your Facebook page and your Twitter page or whatever page you have and read a different story. They ought to be able to see a different person than everything else that feeds into their world. Because you're dead to sin and alive to Christ. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Don't give your feet to walk towards sin and seek it out. Don't give your reproductive parts to be used in impurity and sexuality and fornication and immorality of every form that dishonors marriage you're free don't let your mind think on things and dwell on things that are unholy and impure you're free present the members of your body to God as instruments that word in the Greek means a tool in a tool man's shop that's always for building something that's makes things better and do not present 
your instruments, that word can also mean a, a, um, an instrument for war. So don't use those things in a way that bring damage and harm and tear down. Present yourselves to God. Again commanded. Again, this time, it's in, an, it's in a tense in the Greek that means do it now and do it completely. There needs to be an immediate change because of who we are in Christ. Sin shall not be master over you. You are not under law. What is he saying? The law condemns. That's all the law can do. The law says you shall not commit adultery. So if you commit adultery, the law shows you your sin. And Jesus says, if you think you're good on that one, if you look at someone and lust after them in your heart, you've already committed adultery with them. See, the law can do nothing but show you sin, reveal sin, condemn sin. That's all it does. He says, but you are under grace. What does that mean? Grace empowers and instructs you how to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. A famous theologian, F.F. F. Bruce, said this. The law demanded obedience, but grace supplies the will and the power to obey. Hence, grace breaks the mastery of sin as the law could not do. That's grace. And it's amazing. You've passed to new ownership. Not the chains, not the, chains, not the shackles. You're under Christ. Listen to where he closes. He says, you're free from the penalty of sin. You're free from the penalty of sin. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you, de you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification. The benefit of coming to Christ is that we're set apart from sin and set apart more and more into the likeness of Christ, which means there's less and less sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Listen, look right here. This is so important. Don't check out here. Some of you are going, okay, I got this. I got this. I'm a Christian. I know no penalty, no eternal hell, none of that. I got it. I don't need to listen to this point. We're done. Okay, good. I just got to wait for him. To... Don't check out on me. This is important. We are freed from the penalty of sin, and the reason he has to remind us that there are benefits, fruit of our actions, that if we sin, the wage of sin is death. If we trust Christ, the gift of God is eternal life. The reason he's walking through this is to take us back to remember where we stand in Christ. Why? Watch this, stay with me. Because when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and we try to sin... God's Holy Spirit will convict us about that sin. And if we don't know where we stand in Christ, we start going, is God condemning me? See, there's something that gets really mixed up in the body of Christ today. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There will be no eternal judgment for those who trust Christ. But freedom from the penalty of sin does not mean freedom from the discipline and instruction of God. And if you don't get that truth settled in your life, you will struggle every time the Holy Spirit begins to convict you about sin in your life. Because Satan's going to be rattling the chains. And when the conviction of the Holy Spirit starts coming and you start hearing Satan's temptation, the rattling of chains saying, you're in bondage, you're in bondage, you can't be free, you can't be free, you start believing the lie and you forget your identity and you start saying in your heart, I can't do anything, I'm in bondage, I can't be free, I can't live this way, I can't please God, woe is me, oh God, help me. Paul says you have to remember who you are because your heavenly daddy is going to be relentless to grow you up. And see, it's a crazy thing 
when the people of God are being convicted by the Holy Spirit and they misunderstand it as the condemnation of hell. And we hear it all the time. Don't judge me. I'm not judging you, brother. There's sin in your life and you need to get rid of this sin in your life. Don't judge me. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's true. That's true. But your heavenly daddy says, if an earthly father knows how to discipline his children so that they will grow up, how much more will your heavenly father discipline you? If we don't have the discipline of God, we are illegitimate children and not children at all. But his discipline comes to us, read in Hebrews chapter 12, in order that we may be righteous and holy. Listen, I got news for you. If a Christian brother or sister confronts you about sin in your life, it is the most loving gracious, godly thing they can do if they speak truth in love. Now please understand that doesn't mean be a jerk. Doesn't mean be a jerk. God's got other things He can say about that. But listen very carefully. Many, many of us are stuck in sin and we feel like we're wrestling with condemnation when in reality it's the discipline of the Holy Spirit trying to get our life where it needs to be. And because our theology is wrong, because we don't know who we are, dead to sin, alive to Christ, no condemnation. So if I'm being convicted about sin, it's not condemnation. It's the Holy Spirit calling us to be who we are made to be. And when that's going on in our life, we ought to say, thank you, Daddy. I've got a, I've got a Daddy who loves me. You know, one of the saddest stories that I ever had as a youth pastor was when I had a young, man, a young man that came into my youth ministry and this kid was a piece of work. He was constantly disrupting things, constantly creating problems. He was disrupting in the middle of teaching. He was, I mean, it was a zoo when he would show up. And finally one day I'd called him out and he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't stop. And I called him out again, he wouldn't stop. And he got very disrespectful to me in public. And I told him, I said, you can leave. And I said, don't come back next week. My youth workers and my pastor came to me. I can't believe you told a kid not to come back to church. What kind of pastor are you? I've said, I'm one that loves a kid enough. I'm going to discipline him and see what happens. The middle of the second week, this young man came to my house. I was standing out front. and He came over to me and he said, Mike, I, I wanted to apologize and ask for forgiveness for what I did at church a week and a half ago. And he began to cry. And he looked at me, and this is what he said. I will never forget this. I was about 25 years old. He looked at me and he said, no one has ever loved me enough to discipline me. No one. And then he just gave me this hug and was just sobbing in my chest. I just talked with that young man about two or three weeks ago on Facebook, he's not a young man anymore, he's grown. It's very interesting, that same young man ended up sliding down a slide into a very cold river, really cold river. Began to drown, and I dove in and I pulled that kid out and saved that young man's life. And a few weeks ago, he contacted me on Facebook and he said, I just wanted to tell you, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't even be alive. If it weren't for you, my life wouldn't have turned out the way that it did. See, we've got a really mixed up idea about God and His discipline in the church today. 
If your heavenly Father is convicting you about sin and is relentless in your life about sin and is constantly nagging and pulling at you, trying to draw you back, it's not because He doesn't love you. That is His love. He loves you enough to correct us and discipline us as His children. And if a brother and sister love you enough, they'll come alongside you and try to help you and rescue you when your life is derailing. That's called fellowship in the body of Christ. And if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you've never stepped into freedom. Man, I want you to understand something tonight. God wants you to be free. He wants you to have a freedom from shame and guilt, a freedom from the penalty of sin, which is eternal separation from God in a literal place called hell if you die without Jesus. And He loves you so much. He took care of that penalty, died in your place, was buried and risen again so that if you have faith, you can die in your sin and be raised to new life and be free. Tonight again, I want to ask you to think about this freedom. And I'm going to ask uh, Howard, if you would, to, to get the lights for us. And I want to ask you to take a moment as we watch this tonight to ask yourself, where are you? How do you understand Christ? Who do you say that He is? Because tonight, God wants to bring freedom into your life. And if you're a Christian here tonight, I want to challenge you you are truly free in Christ. You were once a prisoner, held captive by fear, by prejudice, by sin, anger, addiction. But here's the thing, that prison no longer exists. Those walls have been torn down. What once held you captive now lays in ruins. You have been set free, redeemed, renewed, and God continues creating by bringing your soul to life. Where there was a prison, there is now a playground. Where there was despair, we find a wellspring of joy. Where there was death, we are given life. Christ has set us free. So live in that freedom. Lift your voice. Clap your hands. Find your joy and set it free. For you are a prisoner no longer. You are a prisoner no longer. You're free. Tonight, if you need Jesus for the very first time, Pastor Albert's going to join me. He'll be here. And tonight, if you would say, you know, I've, I've heard night after night about how much Jesus loves me. I've heard how He's come to set me free. I've heard how He's died and He's paid that sin debt for me. And He's risen again. I want to be free from the mastery of sin over my life. I want freedom. And now I understand. I understand what this grace does. It frees me. It frees me from the presence of sin and the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And I want to walk in that freedom. But if you're here tonight and you, you, know, you know Christ, but your attitude has been such that you're just living life your own way again and saying, well, God's gracious, He'll forgive me. Paul would say, you've got to be done with that attitude. And tonight this altar will be open. Open for you if you need to just come and to pray. And you may need to begin to cry out as a, as a believer for, for more of revival in, in, our, in this church here. More of revival in this city. More of revival in our nation. You may need to come with yourself tonight and just say, God, Lord, my attitude hasn't been right. Forgive me. 
But if you need Christ for the very first time, would you come tonight? Take pastor by the hand and say, Pastor, tonight I want to trust Jesus. Tonight I want freedom. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, I pray that God, your Holy Spirit would move and work in this, in this moment right now. Father, I pray that you would open hearts Open hearts to believe. Open hearts to, to truly live and trust the freedom that they've been given. God, I pray that if there are believers in this room, that God, your Spirit has been convicting them through this message, that they would stand firm in that identity and know that your conviction is not condemnation. Your conviction is godly, spiritual discipline. That you're trying to train and instruct us so that we will walk in newness of life. And Father, I pray that tonight, God, you would continue to stir us up and renew us. Still in this attitude of prayer, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. And as Kenny begins to sing, if God has spoken to you tonight, will you come? Will you come? If you know Christ and God has been bringing that conviction, not condemnation, conviction, will you lead the way and come? I just want to say to you tonight, don't leave this place tonight without freedom. Jesus wants to change your life and He loves you. Will you come? Please, King.